Welcome to the Libertarian Counterpoint. Your host today is Richard Fields. Welcome to the Libertarian Counterpoint. I'm Richard Fields. On the program today, we have John Cameron, David Lee, and our special guest, the uh, next governor of California, Jeff Hewitt. Welcome to the show, Jeff. Hey, thanks. Um, <laughs> how's the campaign going? You know what? We just received uh, the list. We had to get everything in. Uh, the, the, the legislature and the governor made it very, very difficult. There was a very short window of time to file, you know, tons of paperwork and everything. Instead of having over 100, we're just going to have uh, 41 right now uh, on, on the ballot. And uh, we were able to get up there, get all our stuff in, and we're on that list. And so I'm the only libertarian, and there's eight no-name Democrats, 21 Republicans, five of which have some good names. It, it's looking like uh, we, could, we could have something happen here. And the, the, the main question that I think voters in California uh, would like to ask is, what have you accomplished in life in politics uh, that make you qualified to be the next governor of California? That's a good question. Um, first of all, m my time in politics has been relatively short. I've been in elected office about 11 years. Uh, before that, I was uh, uh, on a planning commission for six years. So a lot of libertarians don't understand that you know, getting into uh, political office, you haven't accomplished anything getting elected as a libertarian until you actually start governing. And uh, I, I, I accomplished my first very libertarian thing about five years into my um, city council seat where I became the mayor of a small city of Cala Mesa. And there uh, over about 18 months, I got my colleagues and my, uh, my city staff to pull off a real coup and uh, kick the California professional firefighters and Cal Fire, the large you know, state monopoly on fire out of my small city and uh, replace it with a non-union and more importantly, a uh, 401k style pension that was both uh, competitive and sustainable in the city of Cal Mesa. So that actually gave me some, um, some notoriety. It made national news. Um, Stephen Greenhut wrote a great article. It went into reason and some other uh, back East papers and such. And that allowed me to actually um, kind of parlay that into a run for county supervisor in 2018. And we uh, we pulled off a real coup there where uh, myself and uh, my campaign manager at the time, Boomer Shannon, uh, we were outspent four or five to one by a uh, termed out uh, a Republican assemblyman, and we came out and we did a, be, come from behind victory, and, and now I've been a county supervisor. Since that time, we have uh, my big issue coming into there, of course, I couldn't have foreseen uh, COVID, but I wanted to take on the unsustainable pension, specifically CalPERS. Riverside County is the largest, has the largest unfunded liability, has the most CalPERS employee of any of the 58 counties in uh in California. So what I've done there is we paid off on some of the uh, joint power authorities, uh, getting them uh, funded up fully, saving millions and millions just in interest on that. And um, we've done things where we made our cannabis uh, policy much more like a regular business instead of even though it was legal, they were doing ridiculous extortion for developer agreements and such. And so that's just a few of the things that I've done. And uh, I've got 22,000 employees and a $7 billion budget. I'm thir on 30 different commissions. So going up to Sacramento is not going to be, it's a couple more zeros on everything. That's all. What uh, you're, you're running, uh, you're the, uh, I think the only uh, uh, large uh, name uh, libertarian office holder in the state of California, probably the country uh, at, the, at the level that you are supervisor in what is it, the fourth largest county in California. Yeah. And, uh, what is it, and you're also on the, on the Libertarian National Committee, so you're a bona fide libertarian. What yeah. is it that uh, makes uh, the average voter feel confident in uh, voting for a libertarian and voting for you in particular to be the next governor? I think that there's a real, a real desire, a real hunger uh, to put these other two major parties, at least make them honest. And, uh, you know, a few years back, the Public Policy Institute of California took a poll. And at that point, 64 percent of all the, uh, the, the, the registered voters that were polled said that it was time for a viable third party in California. Now, the problem is, you know, the Libertarian is the third largest party, but we've 
we haven't had a lot of electoral success. We've run a lot of candidates, what we consider paper candidates and such. And at that time, you know, you, you just, you don't get any victories. And if, if anything, you might get a water company here or a special district or whatever. But uh, we're starting to see, we're getting a turnaround here in Riverside County. My wife got elected to a city council. We had Bob Carwin there in the city of Menifee, a city of 100,000 people. He's a libertarian, got elected to a city council. We've got some other larger water company victories and such. So we will be moving that and building up that bench. But right now, I think they're going to say, hey, look, this guy has the experience and the knowledge to govern. You know, he's not just coming in saying, hey, I want to be governor. Um, and and, and I, I offer a different choice. And, and my campaign is one of healing between these two sides that have just become all about hating and making the other, the other look worse instead of actually offering real solutions. One of the biggest questions coming up, of course, is whether or not Gavin Newsom will, in fact, be recalled. If he's not, the whole uh, replacement issue becomes moot. Is Gavin Newsom going to be recalled? You know, if, of course, if I could predict that, I would probably be just going over and playing stock market or something. And, and But I'm going to tell you what, I think right now, obviously today, if, if, if it uh, happened today, he probably would not be recalled and he might have a five to 10 point cushion. I'm going to tell you, though, when you're in elected office and we've seen this, whether you're the president, the governor, whether you're county supervisor or whatever else, you are responsible for whatever happens good under your watch and you're responsible for whatever happens bad under your watch. Whether it's your fault or not, you are responsible. Gavin Newsom has done everything he can right now to just buy, to buy the loyalty of people he thinks might vote for him. You know, he's been doing so many giveaways with our, the taxpayer's money, that should be absolutely criminal. But, but nevertheless, he has three things that he cannot manipulate. And, and those are all natural things. You know, his his um, his administration did absolutely nothing to to help with uh, our water situation, knowing that droughts come up cyclically every few years. And and just like many administrations before him, they did nothing to to increase the capacity for water, you know, and and and, and really uh, bring up the conveyance systems that moves water from really wet spots to dry spots all over. So this drought, he, we've already got heat now. He's not. He has not declared emergency orders in the Southern California counties yet because he knows he needs those votes. But for about 48 of the 58 counties, I believe now, they all have those emergency orders. When people start having to flush their toilet only once a day or take one shower every three days, that affects his vote. Wildfires, we're looking at the worst season possibly ever. Last year was the worst. We're already way ahead of that. He will be, um, he's already been caught lying about how many acres that he had Cal Fire clear. And, you know, that was, that was really embarrassing for him too. But also rolling blackouts. Rolling blackouts will be occurring too because our energy policy is get rid of carbon. It is the devil and we're just going to keep pushing all this other stuff. And when certain things happen, we're, we're not there yet. So all those three things, I think within the next two months, I think there's a very good chance that, that he does not get, um, that, that he doesn't beat the recall. John, David, what are your questions? I have a uh, pleasure to, uh, to, to meet you, you know, at a distance. Jeff, congratulations on your successes. Thank you. Um, and uh, I guess my question would be uh, political. You know, you didn't mention the, the, the thing that's considered by national voters to be the second biggest problem in, in, the, in the country. There was a recent poll by Reason or Fire or somebody that actually uh, does reasonable polling that said that the uh, biggest problem in this country, 22% of the people polled was government. And the second biggest was uh, COVID. And uh, it, it was straight down party lines. Republicans thought government was much worse and and libertarians, of course, 100 percent of them would say government's a big problem. And then um, uh, Democrats, the other way around, COVID first, government second. So there is, as you said from the previous poll, a real an antipathy toward uh, things being the same. But you didn't mention um, COVID as one of those you know, three things that he's going to get blamed for. Um, and that's something I'd like you to think about. But, but here's my question. It took me a while to get to it, but here it is. Who are your natural allies? Um, you know, when, when you look at European elections, it's parliamentary and coalitions get together. 
to to achieve things, and uh, you know that way the Greens work with the socialists or the you know otherwise. Who are your your natural allies in on either side of the aisle uh, that might help you carry the day? I mean, somebody somebody that would be willing to work with you if you thought you could win, or somebody you know you could work with if uh, it look, looks like somebody else is going to carry the flag. Do you have do you have some allies uh, in, in uh, the other parties that you can work with? Yeah, very good question. And, and let me real quickly address that first thing about the COVID and how it could affect the outcome on September 14th. I can almost guarantee you that no matter how bad this resurgence gets with the Delta virus or whatever else, the governor governor will not order lockdowns until after September 14th. I mean, his science is based upon his own skin. That's all he cares about. So I can guarantee you that. But my... Uh, I do have a degree, uh, a Bachelor of Science degree in biology. So I, I do understand, I can read a lot of this stuff. I understand how viruses work and everything. And early on into this, and, and, and my COVID life started on January 29th, when that, uh, that, that jet with 200 uh, diplomats from Wuhan, China, landed in my district at March Air Reserve Base. So I've been very, very part of COVID from day one. However, around May, I could see that uh, this thing was being handled totally, I mean, totally wrong, that the, the science became the science of my partisan side versus your partisan side. It didn't follow the scientific method at all. And I called for going against Governor Newsom's tiered system uh, as early as May. And I could not get a second out of any of the two Democrats or the two Republicans on my, um, on my board. However, in July, I was able to get my public health department to uh, carry, a, carry out the gold standard of antibody studies where we showed there that the infection fatality rate wasn't three or 4% like what they'd have us think by taking the number of deaths divided by the uh, confirmed cases, but instead how many people have actually been exposed to it and, 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 and built up the antibodies. And I guess that right on, I said, it's gonna be around 6%, it came out 5.9%. And, and so we knew then that the infection fatality rate was much less than a portion of 1%. So. So here's what, you know, my allies that I can work on is number one, believe it or not, a lot of the Trump Republicans were really, really, you know, they wanted their small businesses not to be deemed, you know, uh, unnecessary and thrown out of business. They wanted their, their, their individual rights and freedoms. And uh, I even went to, with evangelicals, I fought hard in, for Easter Sunday during the pandemic to get churches so they could have drive up uh, services, you know, on, on arguably the most uh, important day in the Christian religion. And so I've got, I've got a lot of friends in the ev in evangelicals. I've got a lot of the uh, Trump uh, Republicans that I was the, the one, one of the only of the few in the entire state that was going against, you know, very, very in your face against Governor Newsom. But, but in January, myself and uh, Supervisor uh, uh, Sue Frost from Sacramento put together a conference about 30 miles east and you guys up in that area know where Rancho Murrieta is. Yeah, yeah. And we had we had 150 people come, most of which were elected, several county supervisors from all over California. And we had, you know, panels. I moderated the, the medical panel with Dr. Jay Bhattacharya from Stanford, Dr. Ladapo from UCLA, Dr. Fareed from, uh, from Harvard. And, and we had sheriffs and economists and stuff and I'll tell you what, if you don't think that had an effect, the next day, Governor Newsom raised the stay at home orders for the 13 counties surrounding um, Sacramento. And then a week later, he did that. So I know how to get things done that way. I specifically did. So I, we worked our tail off. Supervisor um, Frost and I just people said, you're crazy. You can't get this done. But I will do anything for my constituents. And so I also have another group. I speak fluent Spanish. And I believe I'm the only major candidate that does that. And the people, all the ranchers and all the workers in Central Valley, they don't like Governor Newsom for one reason, because he hasn't done anything for, for, for water. And uh, they are cutting back. There will be a lot of them that lose their jobs, you know, this year in this drought, because he hasn't done anything to alleviate the problem. And so they're smart enough to know that these little taking $600 here and trying to extend unemployment, you know, that we don't have, 
they're, they're smart enough to know that, that that's a temporary fix and that's making it worse down the line. Cool. Thank you so much. Supervisor, Supervisor Jeff, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, curious as an ex-Californian, um, being here in Washington, I've seen that the state has lost the congressperson in the, uh, in the census. Um, and we know there's many reasons for that. The most business unfriendly state in the nation, uh, increasing homelessness, cost of, of uh, housing, uh, the, the cost of gas. Um, these are all kind of kitchen table things that affect the everyday Californians. And uh, we, you know, they get a lot of lip service from the Democrats, but nothing gets better. It just continues to spiral downward. Uh, what would be some of your ideas to uh, get businesses rolling again in California and, and, and bring in back uh, a good economy that was there for decades and now is lost? Well, well, to start off, uh, AB5 was horrible. I mean, we were already one of the most, if not the most, business unfriendly state out of the 50 states. But when uh, Atlanta Gonzalez came in and, and got that through this very, very progressive legislature and, of course, Governor Newsom signed it off, AB5 ran so many that, you know, it, that was kind of like, you know, the, the straw that broke the camel's back. Look at, as governor, I will get in there and I will get rid of so many restrictive uh, regulations. There's there's so many uh, high tech. The people that are are the real uh, capitalists that, in, you know, invest here and such, there's a 13.2% state income tax that if you make over $5 million here, um, that's 58% of our budget. That's how, that's how crazy this is. It's volatile. But we need to make it so people, we've got the greatest, you know, no, no disrespect to uh, Southern Washington State, but we have the greatest <laughs> climate, got the greatest climate in the world. You know, it, it's not hard to live here unless the government makes it so hard to live here. So this is the first time in the history of our state where our population has actually gone down and we've lost one, maybe two congressional members. Um, we've driven huge, innovative companies like uh, Tesla, like Oracle, like Hewlett Packard. They've gone off to Texas and said, we're not going to do business there. I mean, that, that's that's crazy. Um, Hollywood's leaving. <laughs> and, and, and Hollywood's going to Georgia and a lot of other places. Vancouver. But, yeah. And, and, yeah. And that's but but it's it's really something that, um, you know, you've got to have. Here's the thing. And this is what I found out being in, uh, uh, an elected in the last 11 years. Very few politicians have courage. And uh, you, you look at it, in, in 1979, he wasn't a politician, but he was the uh, the chair of the Federal Reserve, Paul Volcker. And uh, we, we had nine years of the 70s of stagflation. You know, we had high inflation and, and real high unemployment. It was terrible. It was the worst of both worlds. We're going to have that right away. And unless we go ahead and raise interest rates, right now, unless we find somebody with that courage like Paul Volcker had, you know, we've got some really dark times ahead, but we can save that if we do things now and change them. And it takes a libertarian like myself that understands a lot of these things. I mean, I could give you an hour's uh, lecture right now on how the Federal Reserve started and how it works, but most people's eyes glaze over. But yeah. having people that understand that and understand science, Dr. Jay Bhattacharya said, Jeff, just think if you would have been governor during this um, during this pandemic, the science would have been actually good science that stood up to the scientific method, you know. And of course, you're not going to get everything right. But as you transition and do things, as you know more about the virus, then we found out that it was basically a disease of the elderly. And how do we protect them? And without shutting down and, and ruining the lives and livelihoods of so many other people that weren't really ever at very great danger to this. So you know, it's 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 really look. Um, getting people in my position, look, it's, it's nice to be elected. It's, I meet people that most people never meet, but at the end of the day, if I can't fight for my constituents with, without any, like I say, I don't care what happens to me. I want to make changes so that my kids, grandkids, your kids and your grandkids can enjoy this state like we have. And, and there's no reason why we shouldn't. So we need to embrace, we, we need to embrace, uh, innovation innovation in, in, in uh, education, innovation in housing. You know, why aren't we building three-dimensional uh, printer houses? Why aren't we using containers? And with all the new ideas that way, we could have housing caught up relatively quickly and have some really good houses for people that are actually affordable without subsidizing 
from everybody else's money. So there, that there's- Yeah, that was my next question on housing. We have a housing uh, shortage, just to put it lightly. One of my daughters spent a million dollars for a, a tract home in Southern California. Another uh, daughter is trying to build her own home uh, in the foothills and finds out that she has to uh, meet ridiculous zoning requirements in order to build something out in the middle of the, uh, out in the, middle of the country. Uh, rules and regulations and zoning and so forth and so on, what can the governor do to reduce the cost of housing? Well, the governor first can say, look at CEQA has some good parts to it. I think most people don't want everything built in and, and become like LA Basin and one big tarmac or whatever. But at the end of the day, we have made it so, so difficult to do anything. And CEQA is basically just a clearinghouse for uh, different groups to come in that don't want any more people in California to shut down every project. And then we have to find out and vaccinate for a disease that's far more contagious than uh, COVID, and that's nimbyism. And I don't know if you know what nimbyism is, but- Not in my backyard. In my backyard yeah. And, uh, and unfortunately, we all suffer from nimbyism but there are people that suffer at different levels. And at some point, you know, when you've moved into a track that was put there 20 years ago and all the people around you didn't want you to come in there because you were going to impact traffic and everything. And, uh, you know, but once you have your slice of paradise, now you catch nimbyism and you don't want anybody else to take those fields behind you or whatever else. Of course, you don't want to pay the taxes on those fields. You just want somebody else to, to, to make your life perfect. And so, there, there, you know, there, there's certain zoning things that make sense and stuff, obviously, you know, but but at the end of the day, we've got to change those things because uh, we're holding ourselves back and, and we could be in places that we've never been before in a good way if we just get over that. But you, somebody's got to talk about that, just like they won't talk about pensions or anything. I'm the kind of person that brings that up and I will get it done. One of the other issues that uh, I don't, I'm not sure if it's uh, getting much uh, daylight, but we're a majority or minority majority state. There are more Hispanics and blacks than there are whites in the in this state and, and Asians. And a lot of the entrepreneurial class is coming from the minority groups. In fact, uh, in Silicon Valley and, and elsewhere, I would probably a majority of the entrepreneurialism is coming from immigrants. What can the governor do to uh, uh, encourage that without scaring people uh, that are afraid somebody's coming to take my job. Well, so isn't that interesting? Yeah. So we've got high end. We actually have, we have all these jobs that need, need to be filled right now. I mean, there's there's more jobs that need to be filled than than what there are people that want to work right now. And so a lot of these same people are complaining that too many people are being allowed to come in across the border, where a lot of those people just want to go ahead and do a job. So it's like, well, we got all these jobs that need to be filled, but sorry, even though there's a group of people that want to come in and actually fill those jobs, you know, and of course I'm really making it simple right there. I'm boiling it down to a real simple, but, but no, we need to take, for instance, I went to a, an event uh, down in Orange County recently where it was uh, Pakistani Americans celebrating actually July 4th and such. And as it turns out, a lot of these immigrant groups, they come over, they're very, very successful. Because see, they might have been well educated and stuff in their own country, but they didn't have the ability to rise. They have a caste system or whatever else. Like, when people come to the United States, there's that, there's that opportunity to really thrive. And oh, by the way, on another note, there, the gentleman sitting next to me was Josh Newman. I think we know who that guy is, right? Um, the guy that you know got uh, he, he got recalled because he was the deciding vote on 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 the SB one that gas tax, but he got reelected, you know, the next time. And I, all I, all I could do to hold back and not say, you know, Josh, I've got to drive back tonight, but can you loan me a couple of bucks? Cause I can't afford the gas to get home. <laughs> you know, it's just, <laughs> and, 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 and those, and those are the things that are going to hurt the governor too. We're seeing our gas prices rise up and stuff like that. And that hits people right in the pocketbook. They talk about it at the kitchen table and stuff like that. So um, I've been well rece received by a lot of the immigrant community. 48% of Californians, 48% of Californians speak Spanish as their uh, primary language. So it's, it's very important uh, to be able to, to speak to everyone. And, and as a uh, governor, I will be able to give uh, speeches in both English and Spanish. David, uh, John, any other quick questions? We've got two minutes left. Yeah, the, the, uh weed 
not not the weeds that are growing outside my house, but the uh, the kind that uh, get rid of arthritis and make people happy. Uh, California has once again managed to take what should have been a golden goose and throttle it to the point where people are, are going uh, uh, back to their local dealer. And, and all the federal uh, things that, that uh, are being thrown out there to take a look at or make it even worse, more regulation, more tax and everything else. What would you do as governor with weed? Again, with any with any sin tax, and let's talk about a sin tax, whether it's alcohol, whether it's uh, cannabis, uh, whatever, uh, government is evil in the sense that it says, you really like those things, so we're really going to make you pay for it. We're going to squeeze as much, and we're going to set up all this regulation and stuff like that. Well, certainly there are things that can be done that government can do, and actually most of it is stay out of the way, but the things they can do, for instance, like environmental health, just to make sure that you know a restaurant has a permit that they're not you know, serving a bunch of raw food with all kinds of bacteria and stuff in it. But at the end of the day, uh, cannabis should be treated like any other uh, product. And, uh, and what's nice is, you know, some of these regulations that tell you to package it in, in uh, uh, child safety packages and stuff, and then um, have testing to where you actually put the levels of THC and CBD on there, much like a, a, a bottle of bourbon has its uh, alcohol percentage on it. You know, those are all just kind of common sense things that I don't think most, but their taxation on this and this regulation of it and, and putting out that you can only have so many dispensaries here and there, kind of like what they've done with liquor, but it's even worse, uh, has made it. To the, I would look to Washington. They're doing, you know, I was really surprised when I came up here. There's very little black market here. There's, uh, you know, just, just Longview and Kelso, the adjoining city, there's over 10, 12, 15 uh, pot shops all around town. And they're all busy and uh, doing well. And the cost, I've, I peeked in there and looked at the cost. And it's, it's very reasonable cost for uh, marijuana in Washington. So I think and, Washington's a good example. And, and Washington also sent California something else very good. And that's our uh, CEO of CalPERS came from Washington. She was the one for theirs, uh, Marcy Frost. And uh, believe it or not, she's, she's doing as great a job as you can. Uh, I have a good relationship with her. She realizes I'm trying to change things, um, but but at the end of the day, uh, there 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 are solutions that we can do on these, and it's really just getting somebody in there with that authority to make those changes and to oh. disassemble so much of the beast. How oh, how can uh, people who are interested in your campaign get in touch with it? Okay, so uh, you can you can reach our uh, website at Hewitt, the number four ca dot com. Hewitt4CA.com. And there you can go on, find out more about me. You can donate, you can volunteer. This is something that uh, is very exciting. Uh, there's never been a situation where there was a libertarian in as high as office as I am and actually running for a, an office that is the, the literal next step for me because going for Diane Feinstein's Senate seat would actually be a step down for me because right now, a large county supervisor where there's only five people that makes decisions for millions of people is has a lot of say and, and and i've been learning how to uh get as much done as possible remember you're one of five but if i'm governor i'll have the bully pulpit and i will uh i'll make that legislature actually uh start doing the will of the people and, and not one specific group thank you very much uh, jeff hewitt thank you uh john thank you david we'll see you again next week it was my thank pleasure you. thank you all thank yeah. you jeff we really appreciate having you on Okay, bye bye. Thank you for watching the Libertarian Counterpoint Show. In Sacramento, Channel 17 on Comcast. Each Thursday at 8 p.m. and each Monday at 5 30 p.m. for the Knuckleheads of Liberty. Also on YouTube, Facebook, and podcasts everywhere. We invite you to come again next week for the Libertarian Counterpoint.